EW10 Bookmark recently traveled to Dallas for the Catholic Marketing Network's 16th Annual Convention and caught up with a variety of Catholic authors and personalities familiar to our EWTN family. We hope you enjoy the following sampling of our on-location experiences at the CMN. And a familiar face here on the floor of CMN, it's uh, Mr. Vinnie Flynn. Uh, you're, you have a face a lot of our audience over the years has come to recognize. Why would that be the case? The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, okay, I assume. Right, right. That's right, exactly. <laughs> now, you were involved with, the, with the, one of the first ones that was done for EWTN, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, was that the one with Father George Kosicki and everything? Or? Um, the, the first one was with a, a, a Marian priest, and I okay. think with one of my daughters, and then we did a later one several right. years later with two And when was daughters. that one originally shot, the first one that people would remember that class? Was that in the 80s or the 90s? You know, I'm not even sure. sure. It yeah. was somewhere. Around that. I know our, our, our CD of the chaplet was in 93, so it was probably somewhere in the late 80s or right. early well, 90s. Well, let me ask you a question, Vinny. Uh, now you're an author. We're going to talk to you a little bit about 21 Ways to Worship, uh, a guide to Eucharistic adoration, and some other books you've had and some you're working on. But let me ask you just, how did you get involved with Divine Mercy? Actually, it was a location issue more than anything. Um, I have lived four miles from the shrine, the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. In Stockbridge. In Stockbridge, okay. yeah, since I was about six years old. And uh, so that was like home away from home for me. So I began as a, as a child going to the mass at the shrine the year it was built. So I've been like for more than 50 years, I've been, you know, loving that place and going there. So this, this book, 21 Ways to Worship, how many books have you actually written before this one? Um, under my own name, this is just the second one. I did a lot of ghost writing for the Marians. Okay. And uh, I, I co-authored the Divine Mercy Message and, and Devotion booklets, and now is the time for mercy with Father George Kosicki. Right, okay. Well. Yeah. You know, but then Seven Secrets of the Eucharist was the... the it was writing itself in me for about 10 years. Is that what it was, really? Yeah. It just something you felt compelled to put down? Well, I was giving parish missions and talks in different parts of the country, and I kept realizing that e even really good practicing Catholics had never really been taught what the Eucharist is really all about. Really? And, okay. and so I tried to, to take the theology and, and make it accessible to the average person rather than just theologians writing books to theologians and no one else could understand them, you know. So I tried to keep it at a conversational level. You know? Now, were you surprised, my understanding you sold like 90,000 copies. Yes. Were you surprised I was at the reaction? I was absolutely flabbergasted. Yeah, I had no idea. I had never tried to publish a book before. And I mean, it was great that I was publishing it in collaboration with Ignatius because it was their name. But um, I think no one had any idea that it was going to. And I think part of that is because People are hungry to really understand. And as I was saying, if, if the books are too theologically oriented, then you don't, you don't really get it. And if they're too just inspirational, but they, they don't have the theology, it doesn't so you were feed trying you to, you were trying to bridge that gap? I was trying, yeah, to, to not water down the theology and also to give people the, the difference. Like I called them secrets, but they're not secrets. The church has always, always taught but them. But secrets sells books. Well, but more than that, they might as well have been secrets because for oh, 40 years, okay, right. Catholics didn't know. And if they knew one of the truths about the Eucharist, they didn't understand the relationship between that and the other truths. Well, one of the great geniuses, obviously, of our foundress, Mother Angelica, was, in effect, that focus on Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration, certainly the devotionals. And also the ability to be real with people and, and right. conversational. So she, she, she kept things clear and simple as well as theological. Right, there wasn't that dichotomy of being, I, I'm pious, so I have to act a certain way. Exactly. She could be incredibly faith-filled, yes. but very real. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Well, let me ask you about this particular work, which you're here at the uh, Catholic Marketing Network. Now, are you here as an author then? Are you displaying uh, your tied in with Ignatius or Mercy Songs, the publisher? Yes, to all of the above. Okay, um, so you're doing I'm, like book signings and things? Yes, I'm, I'm doing book signings at the Catholic Word booth. Catholic Word distributes most of our CDs and our books. And, and, and they kind of handle a lot of, a couple of different They do. People, they have like right? 25 publishers, right, I think, that's that what they, I thought, they, right. they deal with. Lynn Clicker, I think. Yes, exactly. Them, right? And... Uh, but then I also have this relationship with Ignatius that we've, we've co kind of co-published several of, of the books. This is The Seven Secrets in English and in Spanish. There's a study guide that my daughter How's wrote. it doing in Spanish? Uh, it's doing pretty well for a Spanish book. Is I it mean, published here in the United States only, basically, at this point in time? Um, it, it is. It is, yes. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I was hoping someone would take it up in, in the Spanish-speaking countries. Um, but not so far. Yeah. Poland did. Poland did. They just, they just um, sold 7,000 copies in Polish, which really? well, amazed okay. me. So, yeah. Well, let me ask you about this. So when you come to some place like here to talk about your book, 21 Ways to Worship, whatever, do you finance yourself here as an author? Do they help you come here? How does that work for people behind the scenes? Basically, I finance myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was it was worth it, and it also I, I helped defray it a little. Like my son John lives here in, in oh, Sherman, okay. Okay. and so I was able to stay with him for a couple of days. I gave a talk at his church. Um, so, but it just it's so exciting to me that this book is out because, as I think I shared with you at the beginning of the program, I wasn't expecting to do this. Well, book. Let's talk about Twenty One Ways to Worship a Guide to Eucharistic Adoration. Now, you had the other book, The Seven Secrets of the Eucharist. Is this tied into that? Did that come out of that book or what? Um, it, it is in a way. I, I hadn't, as I say, I hadn't planned it at all. But what it actually is, is a sharing of 21 ways that I use in adoration. And I've had a lot of people, as I go about and I give talks on the Eucharist, and I always try to stress adoration. And then recently, uh, Pope Benedict has been saying so much about adoration and Pope John Paul before him. And what I realize the emphasis has been is Pope Benedict uses the word friendship. And even in now introducing the year of the faith, he says he wants the church to lead, he wants the church to lead people through the desert into friendship with Jesus. And when he writes about adoration, he says that what we've got to realize is the purpose of adoration. Adoration is the personal aspect of communion. That our our celebration of the Eucharist can't stay locked in the liturgy. We have to adore before we receive and during the time we receive and then after. It has to extend and that the purpose of adoration is to get to know Jesus. So that's what I was trying to do here is what ways can I, can I help people with so that they can learn to be real with God and not to just be sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament as if it's a thing you know, or as if I need to say certain prayers. This well, is I have the to person. Put my time in. Yeah, right, right exactly. Kind of this thing, is right. this is a person, Jesus Christ. And he wants a relationship with me. I have I need to be real with him. If I feel like crying, I should cry. If you know, if I if I want to read something, I should read, but I'm reading in the presence of the person who loves me most. But I should always be listening. And listening. One of the chapters is called, For God's Sake, Shut Up. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, Do you think that's all of us uh, spend too much time with our motors running, as they say? Yes. Or I think I've got to talk to God. And really, it's that quiet, that peace, that ability to listen. And it's amazing. I think sometimes people don't quiet down to listen because they're not quite happy with what they hear when they do. That may be. That may be. But I think part of it also is that we haven't, it hasn't been emphasized enough that, that, I need to approach him as I am as a person. I don't have to say, I mean, rote prayers can be beautiful, and there's a place for that in Eucharistic adoration, but I don't have to exclusively say our fathers and Hail Marys and litanies. I need to listen to him and talk to him, and because he's a person present for me, he is listening, and he will speak. Now, you got a couple in here, just, just do it, take off your shoes. Uh, this is one, evict the tenants. Evict the tenants. Which tenants are those you're evicting? Um, it can be all kinds of tenants. I'm actually, I got that from Babsy Bleasdale. Oh, Babsy, sure. Yeah, where she talked about how we all, we, we allow um, uninvited guests to occupy our hearts. And th there's a throne in our hearts, and Jesus Christ is supposed to be the king on that throne. And we allow anything. It can be just our own ideas, our own worries, fears. It can also be spirit involvement where, you know, uh, uh, Father Koziki refers to them as swarms of, of bugs. And he says, we need to say to Mary, squash the bug, Mary. These, the, you know, anywhere that evil spirits find a, a foothold, they stick their foot in the door like a, right. a salesman and they try to bug us. They're like mosquitoes. So we need to squash them. So basically... Distract us from the truth. Distractions. Right. Distractions. Right. So exactly. it can be any distractions. And in that chapter, I actually go through the world, the flesh, and the devil and give some examples of the ways we can be distracted. Right, and I know even chapter 9, you've got Behold Your Mother. And that's always a question a lot of people say, well, this is about the Eucharist and about Eucharistic adoration. Where does Our Lady fit into that? Exactly. I think, um, I think John Paul 
Pope John Paul gave the, the world a real eye-opener when he wrote his encyclical on the Eucharist and devoted the whole final chapter to Our Lady, referring to her as the woman of the Eucharist. You know, that she is the one, more than anyone, who understands the Eucharist. The Annunciation, he called, and so did Pope Benedict, her first Holy Communion. The Visitation, they both refer to as the first Eucharistic procession in history. Well, this is one uh, from Alabama, I gotta ask you, uh, chapter 20, Go for the Grits. Go for the Grits. That's Father, you, you, Hal, Father you, Hal Cohen. From where you grew up, uh, they don't no, have a lot of no, grits, no, so what's the deal with the grits? Here? Father Hal Cohen. Okay. He sure. told me a story that when he was a baby, his first word wasn't dada or mama, it was more. And what he wanted was more grits, because he loved grits, being a southern boy. And later in his life, that word took on a whole new significance where he realized, no matter what I've already received, God has more for me, and he wants me to ask. And he used to talk about Sister Faustina, St. Faustina, that the gathering the gems, that she saw this vision of people gathering different gems, and our Lord told her, some people are only taking a few of these. Gather as many as you can for yourself and for others. So I'm applying that to the, to the Eucharist in adoration. God's there to flood us with grace. We have to expect that. It's going to be real. And ask for graces for ourselves and for others who need it because he wants to give them. Well, as an author, let me ask you, how do you write and when do you write? Because you have at the beginning to the Sisters of the Monastery of the Visitation in Massachusetts, whose chapel this book was written. Was it physically written it there? It was physically written there. That's one of the chapters that I have here. I tell people, you know, don't be afraid to be with God. That if you have work to do, but you, you, you're, you want to take some time in, in adoration, bring it in with you. Offer it to the Lord. Stop now and then and say, help me with this, Lord. Um, I go to Mass daily at the, at the monastery, the visitation, because it's so peaceful and wonderful. And right after it, I stay there and I write. Are you and writing longhand? I sometimes write longhand. I sit in the back. There's nobody else there after Mass. It's just me. So you pull out a laptop? I pull out a laptop, and I, I do it right there, and God blessed it so incredibly. Well, let me ask you, just before we got to let you go, because uh, I know you got a lot to do here on the floor, uh, you got another book in the works, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Or? Yes, I, I'm working on Seven Secrets of Confession. This one was a surprise to me. I was My agenda was right. I was going to finish that book. I've got the first five secrets done, and... Uh, but then this just came up and it just seemed like, okay, this is God's agenda. And I've been working like three or four years trying to get Seven Secrets of Confession out. This book took three months, beginning to end. It's, it's all grace, it just. Well, when you finish the other book, make sure uh, you stop by Bookmark. I will indeed. Have a good show, Vinny. Thank Thanks for stopping by. Good. Take it Bye. easy. And welcome, our friend here at CMN, yeah, good Teresa to see you Tomio, again. stopping yeah. by our EWTN on location bookmark. Now, you're here for multiple reasons. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a book, a new right. book you have right. out, right, called Wrapped Up. But uh, you've been involved in a bunch of things, right? Yeah, but I mean, primarily the reason I'm here is always to, to broadcast our program, our EWTN program live. And Al Crest is also here, and Nick Tom, and we're having a so great time. So that's a time. radio show. A radio show that right. we do through, uh, it's um, produced by Ave Maria and syndicated through your wonderful folks right. at EWTNs. Right. We've been broadcasting live every morning right. at the Catholic Marketing Network. And then I was also here to speak at the Catholic Writers Guild to give um, professional authors ideas on how to get on the radio and do interviews. Yeah, let me ask you about that, because okay. we've had a couple of them uh, stop by, and actually they were very nice enough actually to give me a little award. And uh, how did you get tied up with them? How did they get in touch with you? Had you worked with them before? They've or? actually been, Ann Lewis, the head of the Catholic Writers Guild that's been on my show before, about promoting different events that she's had. She's done a few retreats in Michigan, so I oh, had her okay. on at my local hour. And she said, would you ever consider speaking? She asked me, actually asked me to speak at the regional meeting in Michigan. And I wasn't around at the time. I was going to be at another event. And she said, well, you know, we also do a conference within the Catholic Marketing Network. Right, right. And she said, would you ever consider speaking about doing radio interviews? I said, sure. When I'm down there, just call me. I'll, I'll stop in. So it was a lot of fun. They had a lot of really good questions. And really to, to help them understand how important it is. Everything you say and everything that goes out there is not just a one-time thing. It gets a whole, you know, lifetime and it can be worked to you. Internet, internet and, and radio right. and podcasts right, and archiving, sure. which we all do now on our shows. So it can have a life of its own. So you need to handle it well. For the good or the bad. Exactly. 
Exactly. Right. So this was the idea that if these authors were Catholic authors who were writing books and then looking to promote the books Absolutely. and how they should deal with the media, Catholic media and, and even secular media. Well, overall, just to deal with the media, but also how do you conduct yourself on a radio interview? How okay. do you handle that? How do you make your topic interesting? Why is your book something that someone would want to buy? You know, what, what are my listeners going to gain from hearing you talk about your fiction or your historical fiction or your nonfiction book? Well, it's interesting, too, because one of the things that I think it's clear more and more we've seen and we hear about it is that, and you might experience it yourself to some degree yourself as an author, which is that authors basically today are asked to do a lot of their own marketing and promotion. And so a lot of cases where in the past there might have been fewer books being published, but those that were being published had you know, the support of the publishing house or whatever, right. whatever PR department out there. Now a lot of times it's they'll publish your book, but they expect you to get out, right? And oh, yeah. go out and promote it yourself. So that's especially true for these kind of authors. Right? They'll do a, a certain amount of, of legwork for you. They will contact maybe the media. They will have a public relations or a communications person will do the press releases for you, do a, say, a media packet that you or I will get, much like you receive for, for right. my book. Sure. But then really, because of the fact that they are putting the money behind your product, you as an author, if you believe in what you're writing, you have to get out there and make the effort to, to contact you or Lee or someone else who, who can bring your book to the public. So, But, but it's, it's a lot of fun because I think it stretches you if you're an author and if you're not. You and I, are, we're in radio and TV, so we have a handle on it because we've been doing this you know, for eons. Right. But if, you, if you're not used to dealing with the public, it really stretches you as a person and I think it makes you a better communicator and I, I think it really is going to help you get your message out more effectively. So when you were dealing with them, what was the... Um was there one question that came up the most? You know, I think it was really, it's, it's a, that is a great question. After the, the panel discussion, they said, thank you for being so practical. And we didn't do uh, pie in the sky things. We said, okay, if you don't have a lot of money, there's still a lot that you can do to get, the, to get the word out. The biggest question was, how do I do it? How do I handle the technology? And do I have to be on the technology, Facebook, Twitter, all these different things all the time? It's very draining. It's very time consuming. But just trying to give them practical tips. The biggest question is, how do I do it? How do I handle it? Right. Exactly. Well, you also have, don't you really have a company or a I do, organization as a matter that fact, kind of does this yes, work? Yes, exactly. Right? Teresa Tamio Communications and right. the rest of my T team, as we call my group, they were actually on the panel with me. My Twitter expert, Gail Coniglio, who also does work with Father Mitch Pacwa, uh, Marissa Hornbuckle, and they come together with my company to help people. We actually did the social media plan for Servant Books with Wrapped Up. Oh, okay. So I do that as part of a company, so I was here representing my company. But my first love, of course, is doing well, the radio well, you, and the TV. They, you also got to speak at the New Media Conference as no, well not, you were no, here? Didn't. You didn't do the triple play? <laughs> no. no? <laughs> Enough already. Okay, I can okay. only do so much. I wish I could buy Teresa locate. Tamio, yeah. everywhere all the time. <laughs> okay, it's like EWTN. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, you, it's not like you got everything all wrapped up. So that segues into the, boom, right God's to the 10 Gifts for Women. Tell us about it. Well, you remember because it was your idea when we did the TV series on All Things Girl, the series that Cheryl and I worked on together, and you you got the fact, even though you're a guy, you got what this could do for young women. We had women who were who either saw the series, read the books, or both, that came to us and said, I was healed by the books that I provided my daughter, because what they would do is they would read the books before they would give them to their kids, or they'd sit down and watch the All Things Girl series on EW10 with their children and the messages that we had in there, you are a daughter of the king, you are precious, and, and just reminding them of who they were in Christ, they had healing. And so Cheryl and I came together and said, you know, we keep hearing this. I hear it all the time on the speaking circuit. Self-esteem is one of the biggest issues that women are dealing with. And I said, let's do an adult version, basically, of all things girl. And why do you think that is? Why is that such a major issue? I think it's a combination of things. I think for Catholic women, Myself speaking, we've been very poorly catechized, and so we really have not met the Jesus in the New Testament, and the Jesus who deals with women very lovingly, very directly. He has them as a part of his ministry. They are with him a lot. He had some of the most powerful conversations and messages that he got out through the Gospels came through the women that he met, the encounter with the women, the woman at the well, the adulterous woman, the women of Bethany, all these different women that he encountered. He transformed their lives, but he used the opportunity and relationship with him to really impart wisdom and beauty and depth about who he was in Christ. So women don't know him from the scriptures. On top of that, they don't know the Catholic faith as well as they should, myself, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience. And on top of that, they're getting bombarded 24 seven with all these messages that they're skinny enough, they're not pretty enough, they're not smart enough, they don't make enough money. And that on top of that, many of them are coming from broken relationships. So it's a combination, perfect storm of things coming together. Right, where everything's coming together. Well, let me ask you, do you got God's 10 gifts for women? in here, love, forgiveness, allowing God to be God. 
Is there a different set for men? Or would there be a different set I think set so, for men? because I think this is where the whole idea of Catholic teaching of the complementarity comes in. Because these gifts that, 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 that we outline in this book, I think, are very specific to the charisms we bring to the table as women. We are very nurturing. We're very, I think we're more spiritual. Uh, we are more of a, of a um, in terms of an emotional creature reacting to relationships. So these were designed really, they came to our mind through prayer and researching for the book, that these are the things that women are in need to understand that are truly gifts. Mm -hmm. And how did you come up with the 10? Was there 15 and you cut it down to 10? Or did you consolidate? Did you build up to the 10? We actually sat down and talked about it. And again, going back to the All Things Girl series, what were the things that women were talking about that, that came up? Forgiveness, sisterhood, a problem with prioritizing in their lives. Um, suffering was a big one. Suffering was a real big one. I'm trying to remember what else we have in there because I don't have the book Right, in front sure. Of me, you got forgiveness, uh, allowing God to be good, God, joyful sacramental attitude. Sacramental life, joyful attitude. Suffering, right. letting go. So some of the chapters that we have were ideas that we received from the readers. Others were ones that we know that are continually coming up in terms of our own lives that we think we could have could give a good message about. So that's how we well, came up with the list. One of the ones you kind of said sisterhood in there, Aaron, sisters in faith. Now is that your sisters or other women? How is that? It actually of? It, it can be all of the above. Uh, for for those who don't have a close relationship with their with their sisters or if their sisters aren't there with them faith wise, it can be with their physical sisters it could be a problem. But sisterhood I tried to get them to look at it from a positive sense because it's had a very negative connotation, at least for Catholic women who are trying to be faithful, and we think of sisterhood, what do we think of? The glorious items, right. the it's marching on Washington, the radical feminist of thing, type of a thing. You know, Anti-male. Right, of. so we tried to, to highlight the positive nature of sisterhood. But it could be anyone, it could be your physical sister, it could be your friend who you consider your sister. And then again, being a daughter of the king, as adopted children of God, if you're with someone else in a relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a Bible study, we're all sisters. Now you wrote this with Cheryl, right? right? Now, did you write it together? Did you write individual chapters? And What's how interesting, did it work? what happened was, is we took our, our assignments and we wrote them separately. We knew the ideas and the concept, but we didn't read each other's copy because we worked together on a couple of projects before, so we pretty, knew, we pretty much knew each other's topics and left alone the things that, they, that she wanted to write about and I wanted to write about. But then at the end, when the book was put together, we, couldn't, we were looking at this and we were saying, oh my gosh, this is so Holy Spirit-filled, the way it came together in terms of complementing the chapters that we each show, but each chapter has a segment from both of us. Oh, okay, so yeah. that's actually how you did it. But it's, it's an interesting question because usually when you write a book together, you're reviewing each other's manuscript or each other's portion of the manuscript before it goes back to the editor. And that wasn't the case here. We just said, let's just see where the Holy Spirit leads us with this topic. And in her part, she was concentrating more on the matriarchs of the Old Testament. I was concentrating on the New Testament and the culture. So. Okay. Well, let me ask you, this is one that's a little more on the practical side. It relates to maybe what you were talking about, even your presentation before. The idea of setting priorities. Right. I mean, that seems like something all of us need to do. Is it particularly for women? I think particularly for women because we're such multitaskers and we're such nurturers. And even with the advances that we've made with women's lab opportunities, that we still, the research will show, and this is secular research again, that women are still doing the majority of the housework. Women are still going to, just by our nature, be the primary caregivers in the home in terms of you know taking care of the children. Now, in some cases, that's changing, but it's still because of who we are and how we're designed. So priorities can be difficult, and a lot of times women don't set priorities for themselves. They set it for everybody else because they are such caregivers, but then they get lost in the process. As a matter of fact, a woman asked me that at my panel. She said, you know, how do I prioritize? She said, I, I, I've got my whole life, I've got my marriage, I've got my kids, but I've got to get this done. I've got to be online to promote my book. I've got to do Facebook. And I feel like I'm losing myself in the process. So we try to give them an idea of, okay, first of all, first and foremost, your priority has to be your relationship with God, then your family, and then other things come after that. So seek first his kingdom. Right, okay. Now I noticed there was uh, one quote here near the end of the, near, end of the book that struck me here. You were talking about the Samaritan woman and uh, if we could just start there, wrapping ourselves up in his arms, resting as the Samaritan woman did in that one amazing fact that she was loved by God. If we could only realize that we are gifts, the hand that rocks the cradle would not only rule the world, but save it from itself. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's very similar to the quote at the end of Vatican II. Remember when they said at the closing of the Second Vatican Council, encouraging women to hold back the hand of man? because women have this instinctive understanding 
of the nature of the human being because they're life bearers. And so if they could just understand who they are in relationship to Christ, what, what we could do I think would be amazing. And, and you think it's, a lot of times it's because women have decided to ape men rather than tame them? I, you know, and I think that we, we've got um, lots of teaching on that in the church. I mean, look at the great work of Dr. Helen Alvary, or look at Mary Ann Glendon, how they, you know, look at, you know, Flannery O'Connor and all the work that they did in terms of raising this issue. And, and, and you know, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross talked about this in, in uh, one of her book on Essays on Women. She's talking about the fact that we can't take on the characteristics of men. We have to be women. We can still be in the world and have jobs and do this, that, or the other thing. But the problem is we are either not aware of who we are as gifts, and if we are aware of talents and we're trying to appropriate them as a man would. Okay, I have to be a woman being a man with my talents if I'm going to get ahead. No, you have to be a woman with your talents doing what God wants you to do. So. Now this is published by Servant. Did they yes. come to you about this? this? Is the idea you and Cheryl Servant had? Servant actually approached me. They were interested in doing a book. Uh, they came to me after uh, the success of Extreme Makeover, which you've also had me on. I greatly appreciate it. Sure. And I still had some things swirling around in my head about um, what I wanted to say, and so I thought this would be a kind of a nice follow-up. This is a little bit, if you'll notice, because you know Extreme Makeover was really kind of in your face with right, the facts right, and the right. statistics, very much my New York, my New Jersey <laughs> style. Right. This is, I'm still hard hitting, but this is a little softer right. for me. Not as daddy. Yeah, right. you, you yeah. kind of get the, the softer side of me, which right. doesn't happen too often. <laughs> <laughs> we'll alert the media. <laughs> So how long did it take you and your softer side to write this? It wasn't, you know what, it wasn't bad because I had a lot of the material already written through some talks. I, I do a talk called Handmaids of the Lord, Rediscovering the Dignity of Women. So I drew a lot upon that. And I have another talk, um, Extreme Makeover, Seeing Yourself Through the Eyes of Christ. And then I just love writing about Jesus dealing with the women in the New Testament. And I've been to the Holy Land so many times, so it's easy for me to do, let's say, a you written... Your, your buddy Steve Ray yes, there, right? Yes, right. absolutely. Right. Steve and I have been there many times. So it's easy for me to write about it and just kind of sit down and just type forever about these different things. Well, let me ask you before we got to let you go, any other book in the works? Yes, absolutely. I have another one, God willing, coming out in about a year uh, from Random House, uh, Image Books, Random House. Oh, so okay. I'm very excited about that. Still playing with the title, but the idea is uh, the Catholic version of what it takes to live a happy life. What does that mean? And it's tied in with another talk that I gave called 10 Things I've Learned About Living a Godly Life. And you'll love this being from the East Coast. One of it has to do with the Blessed Mother. My mother always said, remember the Blessed Mother is watching you. That's right. And so that's I do right. have a chapter in there that's going to be very Marian. But we're still working on, on the final title. But I wanted to do that book because every time I give that talk, 10 Things I've Learned About Living a Godly Life, people come up to my book table and say, where's the book? Where's the book? To so back it up. So it's a natural. next project, yeah. Like you're a natural. Thanks. Thank you God so much you. for so stopping much. by. And for all your support and all the great work that you do. Great to have you here at the CMN. Have it's a great show. and a. Okay. Radio show and good luck with your book. All right. Thanks, Doug.